Hello, uh, today we're going to, be going to be looking at uh, probability problems. So we want to be able to find the probability of an event using both theoretical, experimental, and simulation methods. Uh, here we are presented with a problem concerning uh, probability of taking an index card and folding it uh, along uh, partway down one side, slightly off center, and dropping the card from height of several feet. So it's an event where we don't really know what's going to happen. And so thinking about just what outcomes are possible, uh, what do you think would be most likely to occur, there we're thinking about probability. When talking probability, a couple things that we need to understand is, first of all, the probability of an impossible event is 0, which would be the same as 0%. Probability of a certain event is 1, which would be 100%. Otherwise, all probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. Uh, in a situation like the one above, when we gather data from observations, we calculate what we call an experimental probability, and each observation is an experiment or a trial. So in this case, each time we drop that index card would be a trial for that uh, probability. Uh, when calculating experimental probability, here's our formula. We take the number of times that the event occurs divided by the number of trials. So in problem one, uh, there are 60 vehicles in the teacher's parking lot today. 15 are pickup trucks. What is the experimental probability that a vehicle in the lot is a pickup truck? So we take the number of times that happens, which would be 15, and we divide that by the total number of vehicles, which would be 60. Of course, we reduce that down. Uh, it reduces down to one-fourth, which would be 25%. Another place where we commonly use uh, experimental probability is in sports. So if we have a softball player got a hit in 20 of her first or last 50 times at bat, what is the experimental probability that she will get a hit in her next at bat? So we take the number of times the event occurred, 20, divided by the number of trials, 50. Of course, that reduces down to two-fifths, which would be 40%. So... Um, Softball, baseball players may say she's batting 400. Here's a little bit different type of experimental probability. So if you're at the zoo and you observe 119 animals, 19 of those have wings, uh, what would be the experimental probability that an animal at this zoo has wings? And so we just take the 19 winged animals that we saw divided by the 119 total. Uh, be careful about reducing this one down. It doesn't really... Uh, reduce as far as a fraction goes, and the uh, percentage I would round to be about 16.0%. If you look at that decimal, it's 15.966%, so we'll just round to 16.0. Uh, when we have a set of possible outcomes to an experiment or activity, uh, that's called the sample space. So all possible outcomes to an experiment or activity is called the sample space. When each outcome in a sample space has the same chance of occurring, the outcomes are considered to be equally likely outcomes. A very kind of normal way of looking at that is for one roll of a standard number cube. We got six equally likely outcomes in the sample space. And of course, when we say standard number cube, that's just a fancy way of saying a six-sided die. Uh, in those cases, we can use theoretical probability uh, as a ratio of outcomes. So the theoretical probability of event A happening is uh, the event A happening. So if, we, if that happens M different ways and there's N total outcomes, then it's just M over N. An example of that here would be getting a five on one roll of a standard number cube. So rolling that six-sided die one time, what's the probability of getting a five? Well, there's one favorable outcome and six total outcomes. So probability for that event would be one-sixth, which is about 16.7% if we round it. A very common uh, event looked at in probability is getting a sum when you roll two standard number cubes. So here we're looking at getting a sum of five, and I have this table uh, drawn up already so you can see on the left side kind of the, the red or pink die, and on the top the blue die. Um, and again, in the middle, then, those totals. So, again, it's a pretty common event to look at these, so kind of nice to have this to uh, go over. So we're looking at, well, how many ways could we get a 5 if we roll 2 die? Well, there's really four ways that can happen. 
So that's our numerator, and it's a 6 by 6 grid, so there are 36 um, possible outcomes. And this does reduce down because, of course, uh, 4 out of 36 is 1 ninth. If you know your ninths, you know that that's 11.1%. Uh, that one does repeat. Um, looking at a couple of other problems, what is the theoretical probability of getting a sum that is an odd number on one roll of two standard number cubes? Well, so we've got some different odd numbered sums here. We've got threes, the fives we already have circled, we've got sevens, and we have nines, and eleven is the highest odd sum that we can get. So we get all of those. Uh, if we count those up, there's actually 18 different uh, ways to get an odd sum out of 36 possible. So you might have guessed this ahead of time. That's one half, which would be the same as 50%. Uh, so then going from there, uh, without even calculating, is it more likely to get an even or odd number on one roll of a standard number cube? Well, again, there's really three outcomes for each, so they are exactly equal. Uh, you can get an even or an odd, so 50% chance. Okay. Uh, so a couple of other questions with the sum of uh, cubes. Uh, so getting a number less than 3 on one roll. So here again, just looking at one roll. So a number less than 3. Well, really, that's just a 1 or a 2. So there's two ways that can happen, either 1 or 2 and 6 possible. So that would be 1 third, which, of course, we all know would be 33.3 uh, repeating percent chance. And then getting a sum that is a multiple of four on one roll of two fair number cubes. So a multiple of four we would be looking at either fours, eights, or a twelve. So it looks like if we count those up there are nine different favorable outcomes out of the thirty-six. And so that turns out to be one-fourth, which of course we all know is 25%. Alright, so moving into a little bit different area of probability, we're talking about combinatorics. So we use these, um, or combinatorics, to find theoretical probability rather than listing and counting all the equally likely outcomes. Uh, combinatorics includes the ideas of the fundamental counting principle and ways to count permutations and combinations. So we're going to be focusing on uh, five card hand, uh, from a standard 52 card deck. And so the first question we're looking at is the theoretical probability of being dealt exactly two sevens in a five card hand. So what we're looking at here is first we have to determine how many ways can we get a combination of two sevens from four sevens. So that's where we have the 4C2 come from. And then we need to know the number of combinations of three non sevens. So that's a 48C3. And the reason that's 48 is because there's 48 cards in that deck that are not 7s. And we need th three of them, so that's why it's 48C3. Um, so the number of five card hands with exactly two 7s is 4C2 times 48C3. So again, there's our um, kind of combination of using combinations and the fundamental counting principle. And then the total number of possible five card hands would just be 52C5. So you can see those values here. Um, we get 103,776 over 2,598,960 for just about 4%. Uh, similar sort of question. What would be the theoretical probability of being dealt all four sevens in a five card hand? So we would start with a 4C4. Uh, that would be the only way to get exactly all four sevens, which that's actually one. Then we, from the other 48 cards, we would only need one card, uh, and so that's actually going to be 48, and then the 52C5 will be the same. So we actually end up with 48 over the 2,598,960. All right, so now we'll take a look at a slightly different problem, uh, finding or being dealt exactly three eights in a five-card hand from a standard 52-card deck. So, uh, of course, there's four eights, so we'd be looking for 4C3, and we'd be multiplying that by 48C2, because of the other 48 cards, we need two non-eights, and, of course, the 52C5 would still be the denominator. 
And in this case, uh, the 4C3 is 4, and the 48C2 is 1,128. And, of course, we've got our uh, 52C5, which is 2,598,000. Nine hundred and sixty. Just forgot the eight there. There we go. Uh, so we'll find the product of our numerator and uh, see if we can't figure out what this percentage is. And so uh, we get four thousand five hundred and twelve for our numerator over the two million five hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred and sixty turns out to be approximately 0.2%. Uh, so 0.2% approximately. So less than 1% uh, chance there uh, to get dealt exactly all four eights. All right, last uh, type of problem we'll look at is uh, geometric probabilities. So in this case, we've got a batter's strike zone and trying to find the probability that uh, pitch thrown somewhere in the strike zone would hit the high inside strike area uh, for a difficult pitch to hit. So we take the area of the high inside strike zone, which is a 4 by 6 rectangle, so that area would be 24, divide it by the area of the entire strike zone, which is 17 by 22, Uh, which is 374, and we get our probability, which is about 6.4%. Similar question, just different uh, dimensions here. Uh, 3 by 5 for high inside strike zone would be 15. Uh, divide that by 15 by 20, which is 300. So uh, 15 over 300 turns out to be uh, 0.05, which of course is the same as 5%. So geometric probabilities, again, take that uh, target zone divided by the entire area that you're covering. The last question we'll look at dealing with a carnival game consisting of throwing darts at a circular board. What would be the geometric probability the dart thrown at random hits the shaded circle? So we take the area of that shaded circle, and of course area of a circle is pi times radius squared. And so we take that area. Now the inside circle has a radius of 3. The outside circle would actually have a radius of 8. So notice the 3 here, and then they say this is 5, so 3 and 5 of course makes 8. So we end up with uh, pi times 3 squared for the numerator and pi times 8 squared for the denominator. So 9 pi over 64 pi. Notice I don't really want to multiply those uh, pi's by the 9 or 64 because those pi's will just cancel each other out. We're left with 9 over 64 which gives us a probability of 14.0 six to five percent and that one kind of ended nicely so I went ahead and didn't bother to round that one um, at all so thanks for watching hopefully you found this to be helpful